local governments and also their partners um, about fostering a recovery that is resilient and led by the communities. We heard from over 20 speakers yesterday already. We discussed um, public service delivery. And we also discussed um, inclusion uh, and, and human rights and equality. And today we are going to uh, organize our discussions in two uh, panels. One that will be focusing on achieving planetary, social, and economic resilience, and the other one that will focus on multi-level governance and partnerships for the goal. Yesterday, we also dedicated some time to present some of the key outcomes of our annual report on the localization of the SDGs. As you know, our constituency produces such a report every year highlighting some of the key experiences and also analyzing how BNRs are reflecting localization. We also shared some of the key issues that are covered by the joint statement of the local and regional governments constituency that is gathered in the Global Task Force of Local and Regional Governments with over 27 organizations uh, representing our constituency. You can see them now on your screen. Um, we are delighted to uh, co-organize this event with UNDESA, with UN Habitat, UNDP and Local 2030. And I am very pleased to have uh, with us today, you see my two colleagues on the screen, Lota Tatinen, Chief Outreach and Partnership Branch of the Division for Sustainable Development Goals of UNDESA, and Shipra Naransuri, Chief Urban Practices Branch of UN Habitat. Um, Lota is going to, uh, to start facilitating the first segment, and Shipra will be facilitating the second segment. We have an amazing uh, list of, of speakers, a very diverse representation from all parts of the world. Thank you for joining us once again, and good luck to you, Lota. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Emilia. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues, and a warm welcome to everybody from uh, New York. It is such a pleasure for me to be moderating uh, this panel uh, today. And I would like to really warmly welcome all the mayors and regional leaders, the government representatives, the high level experts, and all others who are joining us virtually from around the world. As you know, the theme of today's, this morning's session is particularly timely. We will address the topic of the transformation of work and evolving production and consumption models. To kick off our conversations, let me just highlight to you a few key observations from the recent report of the United Nations Secretary General on progress towards the SDGs that was presented to the High Level Political Forum last week. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is clear that the COVID-19 pandemic has caused massive global disruption, including a global economic recession and tremendous damage to work, time and income. Young workers and women have been particularly hard hit by the ongoing crisis in the labor market. Unsustainable production and consumption is driving the so-called three planetary crises, the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, and the pollution crisis. It is critical that we strengthen the relationship between consumption and production models on one hand and climate action on the other. The recovery from the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic is a window of opportunity, a very short, window of opportunity, but nevertheless, it's a window of opportunity for us to explore more inclusive and equitable development models that are underpinned by sustainable economic growth, consumption, and production. So today we have a very distinguished panel with us who will address a number of key questions, which include 
what role can and should local governments play in the transformation of work and evolving production and consumption models? How are local governments supporting the promotion of climate action and green job opportunities? And lastly, what type of partnerships between different government levels and other stakeholders could contribute for green job opportunities and economic recovery and growth at the local level in support of SDG implementation. Our distinguished panelists will each have three minutes and three minutes only, please, for your interventions. And without further ado, let me please now invite our first speaker, the distinguished mayor of Amman, uh, Mr. Youssef Swavarbeh, to take the floor. Mayor, the floor is yours. I think, Mayor, can you hear us? I believe your microphone is on mute, Mayor. Now, now. Shukran <laughs> والتي تعد فرصة جيدة لنا لتعزيز الشراكات والتعاون لجعل مدننا أكثر منعة في وقت يشهد فيه العالم اضطرابا كبيرا يتفاقم بفعل أزمة صحية غير مسبوقة وهي جائحة كورونا وما يصاحبها من تحديات كبرى على كافة الأصعدة الأمر الذي يستلزم بذل كافة الجهود لبلوغ الغايات المشتركة ومواكبة النمو المتسارع بخطط وبرامج تعزز من وجود من جودة الحياة ورفاهية الإنسان لبناء مدن منعة وشمولية وبالرغم من أن الأردن كغيره من الدول يواجه عدة تحديات ناتجة عن جائحة كورونا إلا أن مدينة عمان استمرت لتكون مدينة منعة بأهلها ومؤسساتها حيث تم العمل على توثيق وعرض حالة المدينة ومنعتها خلال هذه الأزمة وفعالية الأداء المؤسسي لأمانة عمان الكبرى وتم أعداد تقرير بعنوان أداء أمانة عمان الكبرى ومنعة المدينة خلال الجائحة ظهرت فيه الحاجة إلى إعادة النظر في أساليب التخطيط الحضري والتوصية بضرورة إنشاء نموذج علمي لإدارة الأزمات على أساس مؤشرات حضرية حقيقية وإنشاء قاعدة بيانات تخطيطية شاملة لجعل عمان أكثر مرونة وأمانا من حيث الصحة والأمن والتنمية الاقتصادية والاجتماعية وتعزيز الحلول الحضرية الخضراء وحماية النظام البيئي الطبيعي وتعميم الإجراءات المناخية لخفض الغازات الدفينة وفي هذا الدفيئة وفي هذا الإطار حرصت مدينة عمان على تعزيز مساهمتها في دعم جهود المجتمع الدولي والجهود الوطنية في التقدم نحو تنفيذ معظم أهداف التنمية المستدامة وليس فقط الهدف رقم 11 المتعلق بالمدن وبالتعاون النموذجي والتشاركية مع الجهات الدولية والمحلية والمبني على الشفافية والمصداقية والشمولية لتعميق الأثر التنموي الاجتماعي الإيجابي فمسيرة التنمية في عمان تمضي بكل عزم من خلال إنجاز الخطط التي توافق مع أهداف التنمية المستدامة حيث أطلقت استراتيجية منعة عمان في 2017 لزيادة منعة المدينة واستدامتها وتعزيز صمودها والعمل على عدة محاور منها البنية التحتية كالنقل المستدام وتطبيقات المدن الذكية والتحول الإلكتروني والمحور المجتمعي والاقتصادي والصحة والرفاه الاجتماعي والاقتصاد الأخضر والطاقة المتجددة النظيفة وغيرها من القطاعات ذات الأثر المباشر على حياة المواطنين هذا بالإضافة إلى خطة عمال مواجهة تغير المناخي وخطة تحويل عمان إلى مدينة خضراء وخارطة الطريق لمدينة ذكية وجاء جميع هذه الخطط والاستراتيجيات بالتشاور مع كافة الأطراف ذات العلاقة وبشركات متجددة ودائمة مع المؤسسات المحلية ويأتي المواطن ساكن المدينة وزائرها في صميم اهتمامنا 
لذا كان من الضروري جعل محور التنميه والتاكيد على الهدف 11 المتعلق بالمدن والمجتمعات المستدامه وعدم اهمال اي فئه من المجتمع من خلال الشراكه بين امانه عمان واهالي المدينه ومؤسساتهم المدنيه في مختلف المشاريع المتعلقه بجوانب الحياه اليوميه والعمل مع المنظمات الدوليه غير الربحيه لتحقيق هذه الاهداف. فعلى سبيل المثال تم تقديم خدمات متنوعه مع الشر... بالشراكه مع العديد من المنظمات والهيئات الدوليه مثل اللجنه الدوليه للاغاثه الاي ار سي والوكاله الالمانيه للتنميه الجي اي زد للوصول الى العائلات المحتاجه والمتضرره من الاغلاق ومساعدتها من خلال برامج دعم نقدي وعيني ومعنوي كما يستمر العمل بمشروع الاستجابه للازمه السوريه الممول من الاي بي ار دي لتحسين البنيه التحتيه في قطاع اداره النفايات ومشروع قلب عمان الممول من الحكومه اليابانيه من خلال برنامج الانمائي الامم المتحده اليو ان دي بي لتطوير منطقه وسط المدينه لتصبح لتصبح حاضنه لرياده الاعمال وخاصه بين فئات الشباب وتطوير البيئه الاقتصاديه وزياده فرص العمل. هذا وقد تم تشكيل فريق عمل من قطاعات امانه عمان لاداه تقرير المراجعه الطوعيه المحليه لاهداف التنميه المستدامه لتكون اول مدينه عربيه تطلق تقريرها الطوعي المحلي نهايه عام 2021 للوصول الى مقاصد الهدف رقم ثلاث المتعلق بالصحه الجيده والرفاه والهدف رقم 11 المتعلق بالمدن والمجتمعات المستدامه والهدف رقم 13 المتعلق بالعمل المناخي والهدف رقم 17 المتعلق بعقد الشراكات لتحقيق الاهداف وفي الختام مسمى جهود الامم المتحده ووكالاتها المتخصصه ومنظمه اليو سي ال جي على دعمهم وتعاونهم المستمر مع الادارات المحليه في مواجهه التحديات العالميه للارتقاء بواقع المدن وجعلها اكثر منعا ونؤكد على التزام امانه عمان الكبرى في دفع الجهود لتنفيذ اهداف التنميه المستدامه لتحقيق المزيد من النجاحات التي تسهم في تحسين حياه المواطنين على المستويات كافه وشكرا لكم على هذا اللقاء. Thank you very much, Mayor, for those inspiring remarks. And I would like to really commend the city of Amman for spearheading uh, your VLR, which is an inspiration to other cities in your region. Let me now uh, give the floor to Mr. Philip Rode, who is the executive director of LSC City. Mr. Rode, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to uh, be speaking uh, to this group. And I would like to uh, take on the challenge which Lotta presented to us around uh, the transformative force of local and uh, city governments uh, head on with a reference to uh, how also at a much bigger level, economic development thinking is changing around an argument that we really need to embrace the SDGs through a mission lens. The economist uh, Mariana Matsukato has very forcefully argued that we need to uh, enable our development much more forcefully through uh, state intervention in the right way uh, to uh, allow the kind of uh, new jobs and new prosperity uh, to that to be aligned with the constraints of the planet and a whole range uh, of new uh, very severe uh, crises. And that brings me then to an interpretation of uh, the mission, which is not too far off from the recent experience around the notion of emergencies and how governments at all levels came together to tackle one particular issue, to address one major priority about COVID and to suggest uh, in the spirit of a very important initiative called the Emergency Governance Initiative by United Cities and Local Governments, Metropolis and the London School of Economics, to argue that the way we need to increasingly address, urgently address many of our SDG targets may be through a mission or indeed an emergency approach. If we then want to pair this with a, a, a very strong decentralized multi-level uh, system, it uh, requires us to really uh, get back to some fundamental questions of the institutional arrangements within which we embed local government. Yes, this will demand from us to reconsider questions of how we distribute power across the vertical, as well as issues of coordination. 
but at the core of strengthening our local governments, there needs to be something around uh, really stabilizing the heart of those uh, local governments. And in some instances, it's even further enable also uh, the executive to take decisions, of course, uh, as much as possible legitimized by uh, the local population. Uh, we'll then have to advance radical uh, innovation and intervention by being much more flexible and embrace experimentation and accept also in some instances a degree of failure because with the experiments we can't just go for uh, a, a, a route where we know there is sort of zero opportunity for failure. Innovation requires to a degree of course the ability to also fail. We need to enable rapid and fast decision making uh, and ultimately of course uh, deal with a very equitable response to these crises or these uh, missions which are ahead of us. Now, how does this in a much more concrete way then translate to what local governments can and should do? Above all, there is the importance of coordination uh, and the degree to which we are enabling our systems uh, to coordinate across different uh, sectors or whether that's health, environment, uh, transport, utilities, education and so on or indeed across the vertical. Local governments also on top of that know they need to coordinate with their neighbors and have to invent tools for a more sort of territorial aligned uh, approach. The good news is we have uh, detected many new innovative practices around that coordination. Um, iterative uh, new processes that bring together teams, team-based thinking absolutely central which cut across these traditional sectoral boundaries or territorial boundaries. There is a new form of engagement enabled through digital tools. We do this now all the, all the time, but still in government, I think we can go beyond uh, the practices which we are currently seeing and really embrace uh, our opportunities to communicate much faster and better and more inclusively. And we can also build capacity more than ever before, not least because of digital tools, but also because educational practices have become much more targeted and cities can learn from each other. They often have the institutions on the ground that are specializing in education in these related fields. And I wanna finish by specifically highlighting the role of city networks and local government associations. Again, something we have seen in the current crisis, when we move towards a mission perspective, also mission-driven eco economies, uh, a response to the emergency, which is more coherent, these associations which can aggregate the intelligence, the knowledge, the experience of many different local governments need to take a central role, whether that's as part of uh, twinning uh, experiences and uh, bringing capacity and uh, education building to the fore, identifying best practices, uh, or indeed really informing across uh, the network uh, the best practices around mission-oriented and of course uh, emergency responding governance. This will be absolutely central. There are many other roles uh, which local government associations can play, but the first thing is we need to embrace uh, their existence and retool them for the 2020s. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Rode, for those extremely insightful uh, remarks, which I'm sure will inspire um, all our panelists uh, in their work. Let me now invite uh, Mr. Tung Soy, who is the mayor of, of uh, Izmir in Turkey, to deliver his remarks. Mayor, you have the floor, please. Thank you so much for the opportunity and best regards from Izmir. Famous thinker Karl Polanyi's book, The Great Transformation, begins with this famous sentence. 19th century civilization has collapsed. The main thesis of the book is as follows. The free market economy, which was gradually adopted in the 19th century, abolished traditional social relations and created an artificial market society. In this process, which started from the villages of England and spread all over Europe, the masses were migrated to the cities. The capital profitability crisis that emerged in the labor capital conflict paved the way for the First World War and fascism respectively. 
Polanyi's findings still light the way for today because the market economy has become globalized and today it has become more decisive for the fate of societies than ever before. Today, world societies struggling with global inequality, injustice and poverty created by market forces are also struggling to exist and defend their values. The best examples of this struggle are given in the cities because cities are ancient places that have been the scene of the search for balance in nature, life and economy from past to present. Polanyi once explained this balance created by social forces against market forces with the concept of double movement, but the concept of resilience seems to sum up today's dynamic better. In addition, resilience is a unique concept in terms of understanding the dynamics of the local. For example, the effects of the climate crisis and the pandemic not only led to the human nature relationship being questions all over the world, but also put the market society relationship back on our agenda. In particular, the COVID-19 crisis has shown us that a local economic order based on solidarity is vital for resilience. As is the Metropolitan Municipality, we acted with this responsibility and became the first city in Turkey to prepare the Crisis Municipalism Action Plan, which includes the measures and solutions to be taken throughout the city against the possible economic, social, and health problems that the pandemic will reveal. We implemented the People's Grocery Project, enabling poor families to donate food via digital platform. This took its place in history as Turkey's biggest solidarity campaign during the pandemic period. In addition to social economic resilience, we have prepared a green city action plan and sustainable energy and climate action plan with EBRD, who granted support to strengthen ecological resilience. In addition, the Living in Harmony with Nature strategy document which we have prepared recently is a detailed study aiming at the penetration of nature into the city and connecting Izmir with green corridors. Within the scope of this study, we aim to establish a connection between the city center and the culture of the rural area and to bring different and social disconnected groups together. I shared these examples with you to emphasize that Izmir has a strategy in every dimension of resilience. In other words, Izmir is a pioneer city that can develop policy and strategy in Turkey. Izmir believes in democracy, transparency, and common sense. We know that we need to act together with all urban actors for a future that is more sustainable and urban resilience, and we are talking all taking all necessary steps for a green, new order. I'm very happy and honored to share at the United Nations High Political Forum that we are the first city in Turkey to prepare the Izmir Voluntary Local Assessment Report, Izmir VLR, which we see as one of the most important steps of this process. This report has been prepared with a model that I regard as the Urban Alliance and the care so much about. In other words, this report is prepared under the leadership of the Izmir Sustainable Urban Development Network with the contributions of Izmir Metropolitan Municipality, Industry and Business World, non-governmental organizations. In this process, important institutional mechanisms such as the Administrative Committee, Academic Advisory Committee, and the Coordination Committee formed by Izmir Sustainable Urban Development Network provided communication with all important actors and institutions of the city, while various trainings and workshops were organized in order to raise awareness about Izmir VLR. More than hundreds of people attended the online training every day, representing their institutions and organizations, especially our representatives of the sustainable offices of Izmir district municipalities. 
the most important feature of the Izmir DLR report is the local targets and local indicators determined for Izmir as a result of the workshops held with all participants. In other words, the Izmir DLR report localized the sustainable development goals and reinterpreted 169 global targets with group discussions. Thus, in total, 132 targets and 219 local indicators sets were determined for the city of Izmir. Izmir local targets and indicators have been approved by the Academic Advisory Committee composed of respected experts in Turkey. Therefore, we can say that this is a first among the VLR reports prepared all over the world. In the Izmir VLR report, we discussed the concepts of human rights, culture, and digital democracy, which we consider important in terms of sustainability, separately in three dimensions, and we found it extremely important to share our current situation analysis in these areas with you. In particular, we aim to bring our city, which has hosted ancient cultures in history, to the fore against in this field. We would be very happy to see you among us at the UCLG Culture Summit, which we will host in September 9. In summary, I hope that the Izmir VLR report, which we will submit at the end of the month and will prepare regularly from now on, will be inspiring not only for our city, but also for all the other cities of the world. And I look forward to seeing the steps in which interurban cooperation and solidarity are institutionalized under the umbrella of the United Nations. With my deepest regards, thanks to your attention. Thank you so much, Mayor, for your remarks. And congratulations to Izmir for uh, completing your voluntary local review. We are very much looking forward to seeing this report. Um, and thank you also for highlighting the stakeholder engagement aspect uh, so uh, vividly. Let me now turn the floor over to uh, Mr. Datto Haji Zamani Ahmad bin Mansour, who's the mayor of Shah Alam in Malaysia. Mayor, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much, distinguished moderators, speakers, and panelists. Assalamu alaikum and very good morning to all. I'm Zawani Ahmad, Mayor of Shah Alam. Before we deep dive into the topic given, let's have a look at glance where is Shah Alam. Shah Alam is a capital city of Selangor State. Shah Alam City Council is the caretaker of the Shah Alam. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the vision in transforming Shah Alam into a vibrant, conducive, and renowned city. We are committed to sustainable development principles since 1998. Then this program continues to be the recent sustainable development goal and new urban agenda commitment. Shah Alam has started our VLR journey back at 2020 with our SDG roadmap. Our five VLR underlying principle is people, place, prosperity, peace, and partnership the five principles based on the five SDGs. Becoming a resilient city, especially during this pandemic, Shah Alam needs to empower the existing industry and small-scale enterprises. We are improving our main business center, industries, and small-scale businesses, such as hawkers in our local plant. Ladies and gentlemen, the population in Shah Alam is steadily increased. We committed to enhance resource efficiency recycling and increased usage of sustainable product toward circular economy and extended producer responsibility. In order to minimize waste in consumption and production, we continuously practice good governance, multidisciplinary and stakeholders involvement. Every city is facing the effects of the global warming. The consequences are already visible. We are taking many early steps in mitigating the effects of the changing climate. We are committed to become a low carbon city by 2030. Ladies and gentlemen, 
I would like to thank to my colleagues at Shah Alam City Council. The strong belief and commitment demonstrated by them will help us successfully in implementing the SDGs towards 2030 and beyond. It was a privilege to be the first city in Malaysia to summit BLR. The combination of challenges, opportunities and strength has provided a solid ground for us. Now it's time for action at the ground level. Ladies and gentlemen, Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to leave this session with a quote by an inspiring leader. Think local, act global, learn global, and apply local. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mayor, for those highly inspiring uh, remarks. And I would really like to commend uh, you for your leadership um, in uh, chartering your city towards becoming a low carbon city, which is uh, truly commendable. Let me now turn to uh, Dr. Heba Mogadriyeb, who is the chief of regional planning sector in the Ministry of Planning and Economic Development in Egypt for your remarks. Ms. Mogadriyeb, please, you have the floor. Thank you and thanks for arranging this important uh, event. I'm so proud that I'm participating with you and showing the case of Egypt. I will speaking actually in, uh, I will divide my speech into three parts. First, I'm gonna uh, highlight on the economic reform that Egypt is taking this year. And then I'm, I'm gonna highlight on the green economy uh, initiative or strategy and then the localization of the SDGs. For the economic reform that uh, Egypt in 2016 launched its first phase of the economic reform program that's entitled the National Structural Reform Program, which focus on uh, macro financial and monetary policies, focusing on um, uh, developing the capital market and the trade market and the labor market. Recently, just a few weeks ago, we launched the second phase of this program that focused on sectoral reforms, targeting enhancing the production and consumption uh, models on the uh, governor rate level. The reform aligned with both Egypt Vision 2030 and the UN 2030 agenda, and it contains a, a comprehensive set of, ob of objectives and measures to implement the reforms uh, for all pillars and sectors. It targets increasing the resilience of Egyptian economy and its ability to absorb external and internal uh, shocks and promote decent employment and transform the Egyptian economy into a more productive knowledge-based economy that consider uh, the requirements of the uh, fourth industrial revolution. The enablers of this structural uh, transformation are improving the efficiency of labor market and vocation and education and training, improving business environment, enhancing the role of the private sector, upgrading the governance and efficiency of public institutions, promoting financial inclusion and facilitating access to finance, fostering human uh, capital uh, via education, uh, health and uh, social protection. Each of these policies actually are well designed, have well designed implications on both production and consumption models on national and local uh, level. Uh, with the implementation of this reform, the government of Egypt is aiming to reach well-defined quantitative targets of macroeconomic indicators by the uh, financial year 23-24 um, uh, that are reaching seven to uh, six to or seven a gross rate of real uh, GDP. Uh, the percentage of investment to GDP is to reach at least 20% and non-oil exports to GDP to reach at least 10%, uh, doubling that of the financial year uh, 1920. Uh, that as well has implication on enhancing the public investments and spending. Uh, in achieving these macroeconomic targets, three sectors were uh, uh, targeted that are manufacturing, agriculture, and IT. Why these particular sectors? Because of the uh, strong, it's a strong uh, uh, sectoral interlinkage and the imp its impact on uh, employability, the high competitiveness and added value, its share in the GDP, and more importantly, the ability to uh, improve. The reform program targets an increasing the share of these three sectors uh, as a percentage of the GDP from 26% in the financial year 1920 to reach 30 to 35 in the financial year uh, 2023-24. Uh, 
focusing on the manufacturing sector, what are we targeting in this sector in particular, enhancing the sector value chain, attracting lead anchor investors, including the experts of high tech industries from 3% of total manufacturing experts in uh, 2019 by 20% yearly. And we have um, a complete strategic, uh, a complete national strategy for this particular uh, target, increasing the exports of the medtech industries as well by 10% annually and 70% of the uh, Egypt export to be directed to the EU and Gulf countries. That has a significant implications on the quality of the products to ensure such high standard, uh, to, in, to enter such uh, high standard markets. Increasing the share of the micro, medium, uh, uh, and small enterprises in the exports from 10% in 2020 to 20% in 2024. These policies, of course, have a positive impact on the uh, on the uh, employment and mainly employ employability at the uh, SME. I move now to the second part, that is green economy. Uh, green economy is one of the main priority issues in Egypt. We launched the uh, uh, Egypt version targets on renewable energy and 20% of the energy mix. Uh, in 2021, Egypt launched environmental uh, sustainability criteria to green the national budget and national investment plan. Uh, according to this criteria, 15% of the national investment plan in the year 2021 was composed uh, of green projects, and we are targeting to doubling this in the financial year 2021-22 and to reach 50% by 2024 25 uh, in this respect as well, we have different uh, strategies, uh, re different relevant strategies and uh, projects, such as the National Strategy for Climate Change, um, national uh, hydrogen strategy to explore the opportunities of production, use, and transport of hydrogen as a source of energy, especially blue and green hydrogen. In addition, we are working on clean mobility through electric, enhancing the electric railways, electric vehicles, and replacing the old vehicles with modern ones with more uh, efficient energy consumption, digitization and automation of government services and reduced mobility, establishing the largest solar farm in the world that is in Aswan uh, through a private uh, public pr partnership that, uh, that, 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 of course, uh, reducing, uh, creating lots of jobs in Aswan, the governorate, uh, on the governorate and local uh, community, establishing wind farms in Gulf of Suez using modern technology, allowing the operation of these uh, wind turbines without affecting the pathway of the uh, seasonal migration of the birds, applying modern irrigation technology and uh, increase the efficiency of irrigation system to reduce water loss. We have as well, we launched the tariff in uh, feed in tariff uh, for the renewable energy to encourage Like we have lost the connection uh, with Egypt. So let me uh, thank. Uh, are you are you hearing now? We I'm are back, hearing you now. Thank you. I'm, I'm about to finish now. The, the the last part of the presentation or the statement is about localization. Localization became a founding uh, pillar for all developmental efforts in Egypt. And in this respect, I'm going to uh, uh, speak about the governorate level competitiveness English index that Egypt uh, uh, launched uh, this year. It's addressing the developmental gaps among the governorates and creating positive environment to boost the competitiveness of different governorates, directing additional, it helps directing additional resources to marginalize govern rates and most vulnerable uh, groups. It helps as well monitoring the implementation of the SDGs and Egypt Vision 2030 on the govern rate level. The second initiatives we uh, just launched, we launched 27 uh, report for localization of SDGs in different govern rates. Uh, these, uh, these reports actually um, help uh, addressing uh, 32 indicators addressing 11 SDGs based on the data availability, 
uh, it helps assessing the the status quo of uh, of each of these indicators, and then it helps with uh, monitoring and assessing the evalu the evaluation and uh, the progress of the governorates on each of these uh, indicators. That helps compare and rank the performance of each governorates towards implementing the SDGs and to see we, we, which governorates that are doing well and which governorates that are lacking behind, lagging behind and needs uh, more support. The, the third initiatives that we launched that is um, the government level investment allocation formula that we started to apply since 2018. This, uh, this formula is using for allocation the, uh, the local investment uh, fund among the 20, uh, 27 governorates that Egypt have. It helped actually allocating the funds on a fair and objective manner uh, by following a set of pre-announced criteria that helped in narrowing the developmental gap among the uh, Egypt regions and governorate and helped as well uh, improving the efficiency of public investment management and promote the concept of decentralization at the governorate level and promote transparency of uh, public investment allocation. Uh, the formula actually based uh, based on uh, some factors that are smoothing factor uh, representing the past three years average of investments allocating to each governorate, the factor presenting uh, population share and factor presenting poverty rate, and the last factor capturing whether the governorate is uh, a frontier one or not. As a result of the uh, implementation of this formula. The allocation of uh, local investment per capita uh, between governorates has exhibited a, a governance trend, donating a more equitable distribution to, uh, of investment. And in uh, financial year 21-22, the investment plan, the formula was extended to determine funds allocated uh, to district level. That gave more chance for transparency and enhanced the public investment uh, management on both national and local level. All these strategic and tactic interventions on macro and micro level actually all together have significant implication on the production and the consumption model, as well as the role and participation of the uh, local authorities that are the main players at this end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam, for uh, bringing the perspective of the na of a national government into this uh, conversation, and uh, we look forward to reading uh, also more about these details in um, the re VNR report that Egypt has uh, presented to the HLPF. Um, looking very much forward to also lo looking at your third VNR report. I believe that Egypt has uh, has submitted. So now from Egypt, uh, we will travel to uh, Tokyo, Japan, and we will hear a recorded me message from Ms. Yuriko Koike, who is the governor of uh, Tokyo. Honorable mayors and distinguished guests, we currently face two major crises, the threat of COVID-19 and the climate emergency. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a severe impact on social and economic activities around the world, hitting vulnerable members of our societies the hardest. Moreover, the effects of global warming now reach our daily lives as never before, and we can no longer wait to take action. Overcoming the dual crisis is the problem before us that we must solve to create a sustainable city. To guide our efforts, the Tokyo Metropolitan Government announced Future Tokyo, Tokyo's long-term strategy in March this year. The plan sets forth the strategies we will implement up to 2030 to achieve this vision. Our strategy does not seek a simple return to pre-COVID life. It incorporates the perspective of a sustainable recovery, which aims to balance recovery from the pandemic and a sustainable way of life for people. Its policies also center on partnering 
with a variety of players to realize an inclusive society where people shine and no one is left behind. As one of the core initiatives, we have launched an aggressive and challenging project that goes beyond conventional thinking. We will transform Tokyo's Bay Area into a sustainable city that fuses nature and convenience and serves as a model for the world. Next week, the long-awaited Tokyo 2020 Games will open. We are also promoting a variety of initiatives at the Games. One such initiative is the use of metal harvested from used cell phones and other small electronic devices to produce the metals that will be awarded. CO2-free hydrogen produced in Fukushima Prefecture will also be used as a source of power at the Olympic and Paralympic Village. These policies are in line with the UN's decade of action to deliver the Sustainable Development Goals, which covers the 10-year period starting from 2020. And to further promote this momentum together with other cities, today we present Tokyo Sustainability Action as the Tokyo Metropolitan Government's Voluntary Local Review. Now is the time for us to take action especially as we face this major crisis. And the Tokyo Metropolitan Government will stand at the forefront of advancing initiatives. I hope that our initiatives will contribute to resolving challenges shared by major cities. Together, let's advance a sustainable recovery in all areas and progress toward a future filled with hope. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Governor, for those very inspiring uh, words. And we would like to congratulate Tokyo for your voluntary local review report, which um, has been launched today. And we wish um, all colleagues uh, in Tokyo, the best of success with the Tokyo Olympics. Before I hand the floor over back to uh, Emilia, uh, allow me to thank our panelists very much for sharing your insights and your very concrete uh, steps and actions you are taking at the local level to make the SDGs a reality for your citizens. I would like to encourage all of you to visit the SDG Acceleration Actions platform that has been created by DESA, where we are capturing inspiring efforts by local governments and other actors, including national governments and stakeholders alike, to speed up implementation of the SDGs. I am asking my colleague to post the link uh, to this platform uh, on the chat box. And I invite all of you to visit, see what has been registered, the more than 300 inspiring actions that are there already, and register your own actions to showcase to the global community your efforts. With those words, Emilia, allow me now please to turn the floor back to you. Well, thank you very much, Lota. Congratulations for a job well done. And also, uh, thank you to all the panelists for these very, very interesting inputs, very diverse from different parts of the world, but reflecting uh, a, a, a common feeling that both our constituency and our partners uh, have. It is clear and over the past year, local and regional governments and, and their associations have been uh, repeating this message and constantly positioning themselves in the front line of the response to COVID, the pandemic. And as the governor of Tokyo was saying, they are also all thinking about 
the recovery, how that is going to be. And they all agree that that recovery needs to be safe, just, and green, and that the SDGs need to be at the center of that recovery. That is something that um, we have really seen in, in, in the study that we have done uh, towards the localization of the SDGs uh, um, report. It is, is the, first edition, the fifth edition of that, of that report. And we have come to, uh, to realize that whether it is working on food systems, whether it is protecting um, uh, housing, uh, um, addressing the, the digital uh, gap, et cetera, uh, our constituency is extremely committed to making sure that the recovery is, 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 is more equal, that the quality is at the center and that, um, that our relationship with the planet is, is different. In the joint statement that we have, um, that we have produced, um, the, the constituency also would like to, to highlight that it will be critical for our constituency to join the Race to Zero and the uh, Race to Resilient uh, campaign. But they also call for enhanced capacity building uh, for uh, our constituency. There are many local and regional governments around the world that need to be supported in developing their capacities and that need to see a clearer connection between the development uh, agenda and the, and the climate um, agenda. Um, what our constituency is pleading for is an equality-driven system that fully engages local and regional governments and their associations um, in the development of the recovery plans and also enables them to deliver universal uh, basic services linked with the healthcare um, that will deliver decent jobs and opportunities for all powered by this green and sustainable vision that uh, the mayor uh, of, of Haman, the mayor of Izmir um, were, were sharing uh, with us. It is a vision that implies using the most appropriate technologies available, uh, but that needs to contribute also to um, in this urban era, uh, visualize the rural urban continuum, this symbiosis that is so important uh, for all of us. Um, the constituency also calls to, uh, for peer-to-peer -peer cooperation and, uh, and uh, an accountability system involving all of our partners um, that also drive us to a, a co-creation of, of renewed systems of, of governance. And I think that uh, from the inputs from Professor Road, the, the, this is something extremely uh, critical. We are facing new types of crises um, that will force us to also revisit how our governance models uh, function. And I really welcome also uh, the, the inputs uh, from, uh, from Egypt because we, we see that this call for multi-level governance that the constituency is doing in the joint statement that you can see in the chat, um, uh, find some, uh, some return uh, there. And, and, and we hope that that will extend uh, throughout uh, the different, the different uh, countries and, and the members of the United uh, Nations. Um, uh, we have uh, all the links uh, in the chat. Um, the platform that um, that Lotta was referring to, but also uh, the uh, annual uh, localization uh, reports and our joint um, statement. Um, and I just wanted to take the opportunity to reinforce these messages that the constituency are, are doing around the topics uh, that bring us together in, in this uh, first panel. And with that, um, I'm going to invite you all to, to stick around. We are going to have have a, a short break so that we can sort out the backstage and come back to you with, um, with the next uh, panel in just a few minutes. Please don't go anywhere. My colleague Shipra Naransuri is ready uh, here. Uh, so we will be back in a, in a second. Thank you very much.
Welcome back, colleagues. We are in the second panel of the second day of the Local and Regional Governments Forum in the High Level Political Forum 2021. The panel that is about to start is dedicated to multi-level governance and partnership for the goals. And as you can imagine, this is a very important topic that is very close to the heart of our constituency, but also to a uh, um, new inhabitant, one of the key partners of this local and regional governments forum and the local governments agency of the United uh, Nations. And I am very, very pleased to give the floor to Cipran Aransuri, Chief Urban Practices Branch of UN Habitat that is going to be facilitating the exchange with an exciting list of panelists. Cipra, good luck, the floor is yours. Thanks, Amelia. Thank you, excellencies, speakers, participants, dear colleagues, friends who have stayed with us for the last two days. It's always the most difficult to, to facilitate the last panel uh, of, any, of any forum like this. So many good speakers, so many good reflections and ideas and experiences have already been shared. So thank you for staying with us. And uh, thank you for joining us on this very, very important panel on multi-level governance and partnership uh, for the goals. And of course, um, starting with uh, uh, taking a minute to, to congratulate you, Emilia, UCLG, the Global Task Force, and all our co-organizers that together with Habitat have made this edition of the Local and Regional Governments Forum, uh, both possible, but also successful, enriching, enlightening, enlightening and very, very exciting. This space, uh, the annual Local and Regional Governments Forum is very, very important for us at UN Habitat. Uh, as, as Emilia just said, uh, working with local and regional governments in, is in our DNA. It's in our mandate. Localization of global agendas is something we have been doing uh, for a very, very long time. And uh, working with both individual local governments in our technical work, but also the constituency, the associations, the organized platforms is absolutely uh, fundamental to UN Habitat's uh, work. And as, as Amelia, you just said, the role of local and regional, regional governments has never been more clear, never been more prominent, and never been more important than today as we battle a crisis that is unprecedented in at least a generation. So it's a real honor for me to be uh, to have the possibility to moderate this panel uh, that I and and we at UN Habitat consider really key in, in, in realizing the SDGs, implementing the new urban agenda and indeed shaping our our co common future. The call for uh, for multi level governance from the constituency, which has been reiterated in your joint statement, resonates very much uh, with you and Habitat. Over the past two days, we've discussed a number of important themes, uh, local service provision uh, for, um, uh, for the recovery from the pandemic and the implementation of the SDGs. We have heard about the centrality of local and regional governments in fostering social inclusion, reducing inequality. And just before this panel, uh, the previous one facilitated by Lotta, my dear colleague from DESA, we have outlined uh, the pillars of socioeconomic resilience and how to rebuild it uh, from the bottom up. But to do all of this, uh, to recover better and to achieve the SDGs, we need multi-level governance. We need solid multi-level, multi-stakeholder partnerships. They are the enablers for all of the rest to happen. The foundation upon which we need to base our um, current and future work for development. The process of recovery from the pandemic is really a window of opportunity uh, for us, a window of opportunity to explore new forms of governance anchored on multi-level cooperation and mechanisms for vertical and horizontal integration. And let us not forget that strong institutions are very much an integral part of the sustainable development goals. Uh, the successful implementation of SDG 16 and 17 is absolutely essential. Is one, is one they are two of the goals with several targets um, that advance the, the enabling environments at local level and, and ensure the inclusion of groups which are often excluded from decision-making processes. 
I'm very happy to say that at Habitat, we are looking at the issue of multi-level governance very closely, and we intend to deepen our work on it in the coming months with new research, new action-oriented tools, new normative guidance. A key milestone is imminent. Tomorrow with UCLG, we will launch the second volume of the guidelines for voluntary local reviews that explore the linkage between VLRs and VNRs, providing recommendations to both local and national governments to strengthen their cooperation for SDG implementation and reporting, and thus giving a boost to multi-level governance. And we've heard about VLRs uh, throughout these two days. So I'm very, very excited uh, about, about the new guidance we're about to launch uh, tomorrow. That said, and without further ado, I would like to come to uh, this very interesting, very exciting panel. As Amelia said, it includes representatives from different spheres of government. Uh, I would like to invite you all to share your perspectives. Three minutes each, please, uh, because we are really at the end of the Local and Regional Governments Forum, and we have to keep it sharp, focused, uh, clear, strong. Uh, and uh, let, let me, with those, uh, with those words and with that guidance, now invite our, our first uh, speaker, uh, Mr. Abisam, uh, Abdesamad Sakal, President of the Rabat Saleh Kenitra Regional Council, uh, also uh, the President of Oru Fogar. Um, Mr. Sakal, the floor is yours. Merci de la distance. Un grand honneur de participer à ce panel et prendre la parole en premier. Donc, de prime abord, je pense que au niveau du monde, on se croyait prévu des crises sanitaires globales depuis la grippe espagnole. 2018. Cette nouvelle crise nous a créé un grand défi de de dans le temps les effets largeurs d'une pandémie qui a surpris par sa question à I'm sorry, uh, can I pause you for a second? The sound quality is not good. Uh, the interpreters are having difficulty providing interpretation. Can we try again, perhaps with a better link, better connection? Uh, I cannot hear anything. Uh, My apologies. Okay, um, colleagues, um, what, let's try one more time. Otherwise, we I will ask the technical team to perhaps help Mr. Sakal sort out his, his connection while we go to the next speaker. It's an issue of connection, uh, I Shifra. So I, I would suggest to go to the next one and see whether reconnecting again would help. Yes, exactly. So I will I will ask the technical team, please, the back the back end of the operations to please assist uh, Mr. Sakal with with his connection. And uh, meanwhile, we move on. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to invite Mr. Frank County, Mayor of Des Moines uh, in the United States, also President of ICLE. Uh, Mayor, you have the floor. All right, I'll start by asking, uh, is my connection clear? Yes, we can hear you. All right, good. Um, excellencies, uh, honorable uh, fellow mayors and other local and regional leaders, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to address this final session of the 2021 Local and Regional Governments Forum in my capacity as the president of ICLE, Local Governments for Sustainability, and the mayor of Des Moines, Iowa, USA. 
uh, one of more than 2,500 cities, towns, regions in more than 130 countries involved in the ICLEI network. ICLEI serves as the focal point of local and regional governments on behalf of, of the global task force of local and regional governments at the UN processes uh, related to climate, biodiversity, and land degradation as the legacy of the 1992 Earth Summit. The challenges, lessons, and experiences over the past couple of months and years have clearly demonstrated that the sustainability... Oh, sorry, um, my, uh, <laughs> my system seemed to have broken down there for a second too. Any rate, um, okay, thank you. Um, so ICLEI does serve as that focal point since uh, that 1992 Earth Summit and the challenges, lessons and experiences over the past couple of months and years have clearly demonstrated that sustainability of the urban world in the post COVID pandemic can only be achieved if multi-level collaboration becomes the new normal. In this regard, I would like to frame my inputs in today's discussion on three main themes. ICLEI's progress over the past years, embracing the multi-level collaboration experience in climate, nature, land is a good practice for both the Global Task Force and the UN, and some reflections on the evolution of the inclusive uh, material lateralism. First, uh, with members of its network constituting around 80% of all voluntary local and subnational reviews submitted as of May uh, 2021 and counting, ICLEI is proud to demonstrate a significant legacy, culture, and momentum in accelerating SDG localization uh, in UN Decade of Action. Between 2018 and 21, more than 1,200 cities, towns, and regions, and more than 100 countries took part in 146 activities organized by ICLEI. These activities charted the path towards low emissions, nature-based resilience, circular and equitable development, and building more sustainable urban world for all. While these 146 activities have addressed all 17 SDGs, those relating to cities, SDG 11, uh, climate, SDG 13, energy, SDG 7, and consumption, SDG 12, have received the most intensive attention uh, in the ICLEI activities. Of these 146 activities, the Korean National Program organized in collaboration with the local Sustainability Alliance and the Korean Ministry of Environment since 2018 is recognized as one of the best practices of ICLEI. I'm proud to note that as of May 2021, cities, towns, and regions within our ICLEI network constitute close to 80% of all the voluntary local and subnational reviews submitted to the UN DESA. And even more interesting with the new ICLEI members like Ismar Orlando, Malmo, joining these efforts in 2021. I'm also happy to hear that uh, tomorrow, ICLEI US is also kicking off an important SDG city challenge for US cities together with numerous partners. Secondly, the global task force should embrace the progress of local and regional governments in advancing the practice of multilateral collaboration on climate, nature, land through the Rio conventions. On the climate front, since December 2019, we have seen a surge of innovative efforts on multi-level collaboration in rise, raising the ambition of nationally determined contributions from Chile, Dominican Republic, Rwanda, to US, Japan, South Korea. On the biodiversity front, the second global 10-year biodiversity action plan on cities, subnationals, and other local authorities has been agreed by all national governments thanks to the Edinburgh process led by the Scottish government in collaboration with many networks and the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity and submitted for adaptation. 
uh, by the UK government. On the land front, we all supported the launch of the UN decade for ecosystem restoration. These inputs and successes by local and regional governments will definitely play a key role in the new phase of ambitious and inclusive climate action in harmony with nature towards and beyond climate COP26 in Glasgow and biodiversity COP15 in Kunming. However, I must confess that the fifth GTF report to HLPF does not adequately highlight these achievements. And therefore, I strongly encourage a more effective collaboration between the Global Task Force Secretariat and ICLEI on these issues. And finally, with the comeback of the US federal government to the global scene, the urban and sustainability community should be asking for even more ambitious and innovative models of inclusive multilateralism at the G7, G20, and the UN. And as a US mayor committed to global peace and sustainability, I am particularly proud and happy to address the UN community with the prominent commitments and actions of the US federal government as the national and global levels under the leadership of President Biden. Through the outcomes of the Leaders Climate Summit on April 22nd, we can already feel the positive impacts of such leadership towards climate, COP26, and even biodiversity, COP15, even though the U.S. is not yet a party to the Convention on the Biological Diversity. This gives all of us a powerful opportunity to push for G7, G20, and the U.N. to be more ambitious on inclusive multilateralism and multilevel collaboration, the creation of Urban 7, as an input to the G7, where I happily endorse on behalf of ICLEI and the U.S. Conference of Mayors and the Task Force on Future Cities mm -hmm. of the U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres at the beginning of a second term are all important progress in 2021, which can and must provide significant momentum to all our efforts on inclusive multilateralism and multilevel collaboration. As its presidents, I reiterate ICLEI's commitment to support the work of the Global Task Force in the years to come, and I thank you for your uh, fruitful and remarkable collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mayor, and thank you for, for highlighting that multi-level governance starts from the global and the international level, not just between national and, and regional and local. So thank you for, uh, for highlighting that, and thank you for also flagging for us the very important questions around climate, around biodiversity, and around the importance of multi-level governance and multi-stakeholder partnerships to achieve, uh, to achieve those goals uh, as well. And congratulations to ICLEI for leading us, uh, leading from the front in the, in the COP process, both the biodiversity as well as the climate COP process. So thank you again. Uh, let me now go straight to our next speaker, Ms. Maria Chivite Navasquez, president of the government of Navarra in Spain. And Madame, you have the floor uh, to share with us your perspective. <laughs> Queridos colegas, participantes y organizadores del evento, buenas tardes. Arracha el León, good afternoon. Y gracias a Regions 4 por invitarme a participar en este evento tan especial. El Comité Europeo de las Regiones, del que Navarra forma parte, viene insistiendo en, en la consecución de los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible es esencial para los 194 países que firmaron esa Agenda 2030 de Desarrollo Sostenible. Y compartimos con ese comité que la pandemia actual y también las consecuencias económicas, sociales y medioambientales eh, deben dar un nuevo impulso para alcanzar esos objetivos propuestos. Y también compartimos que el objetivo de no dejar a nadie atrás exige que todos los niveles del gobierno garanticen una integración multinivel y el diseño de políticas que se apoyen mutuamente y sean coherentes entre sí. Eh, en el caso español, la mayor parte de esas eh, competencias que tiene que ver con la gobernanza, con crear eh, sociedades inclusivas, con la innovación, con el empleo, la mayor parte de esas competencias están atribuidas, en nuestro caso, a los gobiernos autonómicos y de ahí la relevancia que tiene la implicación y el compromiso, como decía, de los gobiernos regionales 
como el gobierno de Navarra en la respuesta a los retos que la pandemia ha puesto sobre la mesa y que precisa, bueno, pues sobre todo de esa aceleración necesaria para avanzar en el cumplimiento de los ODS. Y quisiera compartir con ustedes cómo desde el gobierno de Navarra estamos liderando y fomentando esa recuperación resiliente. Hace ya algunos meses aprobamos el plan Reactivar Navarra, Nafarroa Suspertu, como respuesta a las consecuencias sociales, económicas y medioambientales que la pandemia está teniendo en nuestra comunidad. La crisis del coronavirus ha dejado patente que la comunidad foral no es ajena a las grandes dinámicas internacionales. Efectivamente, la pandemia ha sido global, como también son, lo son las grandes transformaciones que exige esa Agenda 2030 y que nos propone como palancas de cambio y que definen ese nuevo escenario mundial. Y Navarra se identifica plenamente con esas transformaciones, por eso ese plan que os comentaba, ese plan Reactivar Navarra, se focaliza en varios puntos concretos que voy a, que voy a detallar. Modernizar nuestra economía en el contexto de la digitalización, aprovechando las fortalezas de nuestro tejido económico e industrial, mejorando la conectividad, favoreciendo el emprendimiento y la innovación digital y con ello bueno, pues pretendemos avanzar en la consecución de los ODS, pues el número 8, trabajo decente y crecimiento económico, número 9, industria e innovación y número 12, producción y consumo sostenibles. Otro objetivo, descarbonizar la producción y el consumo luchando contra el cambio climático, recuperando posiciones en materia de energías renovables reduciendo las emisiones y estructurando la economía y la sociedad desde un enfoque basado en la sostenibilidad. Y las medidas asociadas en esta línea estratégica contribuirán bueno, pues al ODS 5, energías limpias, y el 13, cambio climático. Incrementar la cohesión social y garantizar la igualdad de oportunidades, haciendo frente a los impactos sociales de la crisis del coronavirus y reforzando los instrumentos de protección social existentes. Por lo tanto, la consecución de los ODS 1, lucha contra la pobreza, 3. Salud. 4. Educación. 5. Igualdad entre hombres y mujeres. y 10. Igualdad económica. Siguiente objetivo, vertebrar el territorio y luchar contra la despoblación, invirtiendo en infraestructuras necesarias, reforzando el papel de las comarcas y municipios y avanzando en la generación de nuevas oportunidades para el desarrollo rural. Pretendemos así avanzar en la consecución del ODS 2, Agricultura Sostenible y Seguridad Alimentaria, 11. Ciudades y Territorios Sostenibles y 15 ecosistemas terrestres. El siguiente pilar, profundizar en nuestro marco propio de convivencia, garantizando una sociedad diversa, rica en derechos, resiliente y democrática, como una de nuestras principales señas de identidad. Por todo ello, avanzaremos en la consecución del ODS 16, instituciones sólidas, participativas y sociedades pacíficas. Estos ejes, como decía, ejes prioritarios y sus medidas concretas, se ven acompañadas por dos líneas transversales, precondición para un avance rápido en nuestros objetivos. La reforma y el refuerzo del papel del sector público, estrechamente vinculado al objetivo al ODS 16, instituciones sólidas y participativas, y también la apertura y consolidación de nuestra dimensión exterior e internacional, lo que implica nuestro compromiso con el ODS 17, Alianza por los ODS. Reactivar Navarra da continuidad al alineamiento con las principales estrategias de la Unión Europea, asumiendo los objetivos de los planes de recuperación de la Unión y maximizando su impacto en el conjunto de la comunidad. Pero también apuesta por una Navarra solidaria, como queda recogido en el tercer plan director de cooperación al desarrollo y por el que se refuerza una mayor especialización geográfica y sectorial para mejorar el impacto de la cooperación del Gobierno de Navarra. Y termino uniéndome al compromiso manifestado por el Comité Europeo de las Regiones de reforzar los lazos de asociación con Naciones Unidas, la OCDE, Eurocities, la ARE, el CMRE y Region Force para acelerar la localización de los ODS y defenderlos como un valor fundamental para todos ellos. Por ello, es fundamental el reconocimiento de los niveles subestatales y en particular de las regiones como actores políticos también en el ámbito internacional. Las jornadas de ayer y de hoy, enmarcada en, en el foro de alto nivel de Naciones Unidas, es precisamente un magnífico ejemplo y espacio para ese reconocimiento y para la visibilización del papel que jugamos y para no dejar a nadie atrás. Muchas gracias, es que ricasco. Thank you very, very much, both for 
you know, aligning and explaining how you've aligned your objectives with the with the sustainable development goals in such an articulate fashion. Thank you. Uh, and also for reinforcing the point, the very important point, that local and regional governments are not merely arms of delivery. They are political actors and they are political agents and they must be engaged at the highest multilateral level and at all levels in all conversations if a difference has to be made on uh, leaving no one behind. So thank you very much, uh, Ms. Navasquez, for, uh, for highlighting those, uh, those dimensions. Uh, for us. Let us move now, uh, keeping it going, let us move to Argentina. And it's my pleasure to invite Mr. Fernando Quiroga, General Director of International Relations of the National Council for the Coordination of Social Policies from Argentina. You have the floor, sir. Muchas gracias. Buenos días a todos y a todas. Voy a tratar de hablar lento para favorecer el trabajo de los intérpretes. Este, y que no nos odien. Eh, bueno, en principio comentarles que es un placer estar acá presente con ustedes representando a la Argentina. Argentina es un país que está fuertemente comprometido con la Agenda 2030. Ustedes saben que el año pasado en el Foro Político de Alto Nivel del 2020 presentamos nuestro segundo informe voluntario nacional con digamos los avances, pero también con algunas deudas pendientes, por supuesto, y estancamientos este, en materia de implementación de los ODS en Argentina, producto del, del último periodo gubernamental que, que nos antecedió, ¿no? Es una realidad. Y, y que el próximo año, en el 2022, Argentina ya ratificó su compromiso, su voluntad de presentar su tercer informe voluntario nacional, que va a dar cuenta realmente, digamos, de este periodo del nuevo gobierno que se inició en 2019 y que entonces tendríamos dos años prácticamente para poder rendir cuentas de que si efectivamente estamos avanzando, estamos yendo por el buen camino, o todavía tenemos que generar mecanismos de aceleración, digamos, de los ODS en esta última década, menos de una década que nos queda por delante. Bueno, en segundo lugar, eh, luego de ratificar el compromiso de Argentina con la Agenda 2030, manifestar también que para Argentina la Agenda 2030 es parte constitutiva de su política internacional, es parte de nuestra política exterior, así como el respeto a los principios de derecho internacional, así como el respeto a la soberanía, por supuesto, la cuestión marina es central para nosotros, así como el multilateralismo y también cuestiones vinculadas con la integración regional y la cooperación sur-sur. En ese sentido, la Agenda 2030 hace parte, digamos, de estos lineamientos centrales de la política exterior Argentina. Pero no solamente es eso, sino que también para Argentina la Agenda 2030 es una agenda de desarrollo, no solamente global, sino también una agenda de desarrollo nacional. Es decir, que Argentina toma como propio los postulados que plantean los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible e intenta, a partir de eso, construir su plan estratégico nacional para la implementación de la Agenda 2030 a través de acciones concretas que impacten en los territorios. Es decir, que modifiquen, que transformen la calidad de vida este, de nuestros pueblos, de nuestras comunidades. Es por eso que Argentina desarrolló, digamos, un mecanismo de participación interinstitucional este, coordinado por nuestro Consejo de Políticas Sociales, que está presidido por Victoria Tolosa Paz en Argentina, que tiene esa responsabilidad y que está incluido, por, digamos, integrado por todos los ministerios nacionales que hacen parte del gobierno argentino, es decir, tanto el Ministerio de Desarrollo Social como el Ministerio de Salud, el de Mujeres, etcétera, todos, y conjuntamente trabajamos, digamos, para la elaboración de ese plan estratégico. Al cabo de un año de trabajo, luego del foro del 2020, Argentina inició, digamos, este recorrido de construcción de la nueva matriz ODS, que es este plan que les comento, y al cabo de un año decía, tenemos ya terminado nuestro plan, y tenemos hoy, digamos, de las 169 metas que que se acordó a nivel global, Argentina adoptó 121 metas como prioritarias para desarrollar eh, a nivel nacional. 40 metas más que en la época pasada. Y sobre esas metas, obviamente todas con sus indicadores de seguimiento para poder monitorear efectivamente si avanzamos o no, también con acciones concretas que Argentina ya definió que, va a, que está desarrollando y que va a seguir desarrollando para contribuir con la implementación y, y la consecución de los objetivos. Y tenemos 1.050 intervenciones de políticas públicas ya definidas por ministerios 
que estamos trabajando en función de la Agenda 2030. Pero también ya mencionaba que la Agenda 2030 para Argentina es una agenda global de desarrollo, luego dije una agenda nacional de desarrollo, y también agregamos que es una agenda territorial o local de desarrollo. Por eso que tenemos, y ahí nos metemos en el campo de la cuestión multinivel, que es importante, digamos, Naciones Unidas, Argentina Nación, y luego los estados federales y, y municipales, ahí entonces construimos algunos mecanismos también de participación con los otros, con los estados subnacionales, podríamos decir, para que se entienda bien el concepto en Argentina, que son 24. Con ello conformamos una red federal de ODS con quienes venimos trabajando mes a mes este, a través de mecanismos que fortalezcan las capacidades de gestión de cada estado, de cada estado subnacional, digo, para trabajar con la Agenda 2030 adaptada a la realidad y a las prioridades, por supuesto, identitarias, culturales, territoriales, ambientales, etcétera, que tenemos en nuestra tan grande y diversa Argentina, ¿no? Y junto con los estados subnacionales, estamos trabajando también y avanzando fuertemente, aunque es un poco más difícil, con los gobiernos locales. En Argentina tenemos una extensión territorial muy importante, lo ven en el mapa, <risa> digamos, y tenemos aproximadamente 2.300 gobiernos locales en Argentina. Es como casi inabarcable en un, en un periodo de tiempo corto poder, digamos, dar cuenta de una interacción con todos esos gobiernos locales, pero bueno, con los gobiernos subnacionales. Uh -huh. Oops. I think we have another oops moment. Uh, apologies, these connection issues really You know, you'd think we'd, we would have all, we would have it all figured out after 18 months of running webinars, uh, but we don't. I think we've, we've uh, lost our colleague from Argentina. And um, I think without further ado, we will move on um, to Edgar Peters, Professor Edgar Peters, the director of the African Center for Cities, an old friend also of you and Habitat. Welcome, Edgar. Fernando, I'm sorry we lost you. And uh, unless you'd like estoy, to estoy. unless you'd like to conclude quickly, because your connection is very unstable. Sí, sí perdón, perdón. Gracias por, gracias por la oportunidad. Voy redondeando entonces para pasar la palabra al siguiente participante. Estaba mencionando, digamos, el trabajo con los gobiernos locales, que nos parece muy importante también, porque es una agenda, como decía, territorial y una agenda local. Y en ese sentido, venimos trabajando con este, aproximadamente 124 gobiernos locales ya en Argentina, con quienes tenemos un trabajo fuerte este, de cooperación para adaptar la agenda a su propia realidad local, y también en ese entorno, y no solamente en el nivel local, sino también en el nacional, pero también en el local, generamos instancias de participación social, y ahí introducimos el concepto de las alianzas tan importantes, que para Argentina también lo son, digamos, tanto con el sector privado como con la sociedad civil, incluyendo sindicatos, ONGs y todos los actores que conforman una comunidad. De esa manera, con los gobiernos locales, con el apoyo de los gobiernos subnacionales, con el apoyo de la cooperación internacional y el sistema de ONU en Argentina y con la vocación política del gobierno nacional, vamos trabajando en instancias de participación territorial, digamos, en cada territorio, valga la redundancia, en cada comunidad, para transformar esos objetivos que nos plantea la agenda en acciones concretas en cada territorio con participación de la sociedad civil. A eso nosotros le llamamos territorialización de la Agenda 2030. Lo dejo acá porque el tiempo se agota y mi conexión no es muy estable. Les agradezco mucho por escucharme y me quedo este, atento al resto thank de Gracias very Gracias. much and thank you despite that problematic connection uh you know uh making those very very important points for your wholehearted embrace of the sdgs your second vnr your third vnr coming up uh your work with multi on multi-level governance your commitment to working with your 400 plus local governments um and for the multi-stakeholder partnerships that you also mentioned at the end and if i may nudge you in those vnr in between those vnrs if we can encourage you to also report on the new urban agenda that would be great 
Thank you. Uh, thank you again for uh, for that presentation uh, and and for that uh, for that update on what what's happening in Argentina. Edgar, thank you for your patience. Can I go straight to you for your perspectives on on what you've been hearing and and the importance of multi level governance uh, from uh, from your point of view? Thank you so much, and um, I greet all the esteemed participants. And given the limited time, I really just want to make one point. And I guess I'm the only non-politician on the panel. And so I'll bring us sort of a civil society perspective to the discussion. And my one proposition is really that if in this debate on multi-level governance, that at the heart has to be a vision for vibrant, organized and engaged communities that that's got to live at the center. That's got to be the beating heart of the multi-level governance system. So of course I appreciate, given the disjuncture in terms of global governance arrangements and the lack of representation for local and regional government, governments, that that is the strategic focus of a lot of the conversation. But given the distributional politics at the heart of the SDGs and achieving that, if we don't have empowered democratic uh, community organizations and social movements, um, you know, we can reform all we want at the global level, but we're essentially going to continue to live with elite pacts. So I want to illustrate this argument with a very simple story from Cape Town. Last year with lockdown, March, April, up until August, September, the economy, like everywhere else in the world, ground to a halt. Um, communities that were already poor, excluded from the urban economy, were left by the wayside. And what emerged in that context was really profound and dramatic organizational mobilization throughout society. And what was distinctive about the COVID period was that not only did we see the usual suspects, the trade unions, the urban social movements and so forth mobilizing, but we saw the middle classes organizing as well. And something rather remarkable emerges in the, in the South African context, something called community action networks. And these were mechanisms that allowed middle-class concerned citizens to various workplace associations and so forth to, through WhatsApp and other digital means, engage with movements and organizations and wealthy organizations in the poorest communities of the city to deal with the extreme emergency of the time, emergency around access to water and sanitation services, emergency around access to food, emergencies to understand what the public education task was around masking, around basic hygiene and so forth. And what emerged within that was a fascinating experiment, albeit it was short-lived, where we could see the glimpse of what a society looks like that practices solidarity of one form or another. But one of the interesting things that emerged within this was a debate around how to deal with food insecurity and how to understand food access as an urban systemic question and not a matter of just welfare relief. And an interesting debate emerged whether the poor should be getting food parcels or whether they should be given digital vouchers so that they could exercise choice in where they and what they will purchase. And why this mattered was because if they received food parcels, it would have killed off the informal economy and it would have killed off informal food vendors. And these are the lifeblood of a lot of the community and the social activities within these neighborhoods. This is but one example, there are many others. The point that I want to make about this is that through this form of social solidarity, the middle class biases and stereotypes about a paternalistic form of welfareism was immediately exposed. And people thought they were doing good, but actually what they were doing by insisting on food parcels was to fundamentally misunderstand and misread the livelihood dynamics and practices and institutions within poor neighborhoods. Fast forward to July, 2021. The literally hundreds of CAMs, as we call them community action networks, have all dissipated they no longer exist in the same vibrant form. Instead, what we have is now something called the Western Cape Food Forum, which is an intermediary space where organized groups, including the private sector, the retail sector, informal food vendors and so on, are discussing what Cape Town's urban food system should look like and how to retain some of the solidarity 
solidarity related aspects within this. And I don't have to make the point, obviously, that this goes to the heart of what localizing SDGs mean. It's these practical debates about access, about equitable access and control. And what strikes me within this, and this is the lesson that I just want to leave with you for today, is that there was an opportunity here that we didn't capitalize on. We didn't try and figure out how to institutionalize this kind of civil society mobilization and empowerment. And what I would want to encourage is that as we think through multi-level governance and as we imagine what empowered, well-led, democratic civil society organizations could look like is that we imagine ideas around a citizenship academy where a very small percentage of infrastructure and service delivery transactions get put into a pot to support the nurturing and invest in the production of capable, articulate, focused, democratic civil society organizations and where people are trained to both engage with planning, to engage with community management, to engage with digital tools to support those processes, and very importantly, to build social enterprises that can underpin new kinds of green service delivery models. And I think what we will all see is that what will emerge from a system like that is a new class of political leadership. Because let's admit it, our political parties are in deep crisis all over the world. We need other avenues and mechanisms for people to come into politics so that we can in some ways begin to mitigate some of the distortions that have entered into the incentive systems that often live at the heart of power within political parties. So there's some deeper democratic questions here. And I want to suggest that yes, let's focus on reforming global institutions, the multilateral system and so on and so on. But let's not lose sight that the most important point of power and transformation are citizens. And most importantly, organized citizens that believe in rights-based democratic politics. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edgar, and thank you for bringing that perspective back into the room. I know uh, the, the constituency of local and regional governments is absolutely and deeply committed to the whole issue of, of uh, working closely with uh, in solidarity with community-based movements, with the whole relationship between the Global Task Force and the General Assembly of Partners, within which uh, you know the community organizations are also a, a very strong voice. Yeah. But, I, but I will leave it to Amelia to perhaps reflect on this as she closes as well. Very, very, very important uh, dimensions. I do want to flag one thing which you said, which I think is, is fundamental. Um, Throughout the course of the last uh, year, we had a lot of experiences shared through the UCLG and Habitat series, Metropolis series on live learning, the live learning experience series. And constantly the point was being made that there is innovation, there is disruptive uh, you know, uh, actions, there are new ways of working. The point is to learn from them and institutionalize them, exactly what you just said. Let us not miss the opportunity to do things differently and to change things for the better, not fall back into the old normal, but really leapfrog into a new normal based on the experience of this of this time. So thank you for, for flagging that and for bringing those uh, perspectives to the very, very important perspectives to the table. Thank you. I'm going to try again to see if uh, we have uh, uh, Mr. Sakal uh, from Rabat. Do we have you back? Yes, uh, madam. Yes, uh, I hear you. Bien? Yes, I hear you well, absolutely. Um, would you like to Moi, try again? Oui. Très bien, donc... Madame, en assistant, dans notre monde qui se croyait prévenu des crises sanitaires globales depuis la guerre espagnole de 2018, a subitement mis en digéré dans le temps et fait ravageur d'une pandémie qui a surpris par sa soudaineté son oncle du niveau sanitaire, économique. Son... Il s'est agi dans l'épreuve de On pensait avoir des limites déterminantes de le fonctionnement. Ceci nous a aussi tous amenés à questionner les modèles de développement pratiques jusqu'à eu égard à la grande fragilité du système par 
Elle est, à mon sens, même si elle peut paraître contradictoire, important d'emprunter deux voies parallèles et complémentaires pour reconstruire le monde post S'il s'avère essentiel de maintenir les aspects de globalisation et tout ce qu'il offre opportunité d'ouverture, d'échange et de contarité entre les nations, et les certain qu'il va falloir se recentrer sur la protection et le développement des économies locales, de développer des chaînes logistiques et d'approvisionnement courtes et de donner la priorité à la garantie des services de proximité aux populations, notamment dans les secteurs clés comme la santé, l'enseignement et le social. Comme vous le savez, vous, ces trois secteurs sont fortement sollicités lors de cette crise sanitaire et ont fait ressurgir les inégalités profondes de l'accès aux services entre différents pays, mais également entre les territoires d'une même nation, notamment entre l'urbain et le rural, entre les zones centrales, les villes et les ports. La prise en charge des multiples effets de cette pandémie mondiale interpelle aussi aujourd'hui aussi bien les États que les régions et les autres collectivités territoriales. Ils sont tous appelés à agir ensemble en adorant les bonnes stratégies de mise en cohérence et les modes d'action les plus efficaces de coordination de l'action de diverses échelles territoriales. Il s'agit là d'une opportunité de remettre en perspective le rôle fondamental des régions en tant qu'échelle territoriale la plus appropriée pour concevoir en œuvre des programmes de développement durable, concerté, répondant au mieux aux besoins spécifiques des différentes composantes de leur territoire et de leur population. Pour cela, les régions sont appelées à innover en termes d'outils et de mécanismes de gouvernance pour une plus grande efficacité de leur action à plusieurs niveaux d'interrelier. de l'efficacité stratégique prospective qui doivent intégrer de plus en plus dans leur cadre logique les outils des instituts et aux dynamiques œuvres sur le territoire. Deux, les modalités et critères de définition d'action en accordant la priorité aux citoyens ayant un impact direct sur la France, plutôt euh, en accordant la priorité aux actions ayant un impact direct sur la route de l'économie et de l'emploi en favorisant les apports de la démarche territoriale participative et en adaptant les interventions aux spécificités territoriales. Trois, les impératifs de la durabilité des processus et actions engagées qui nécessitent la réponse dans les médias aux urgences, de hiérarchiser les projets et ce qui offre les meilleurs potentiels d'effets multiplicateurs d'activités et de bénéfices positifs pour la société. Quatre, la valorisation des apports du numérique la démocratisation de l'accès et la réduction des fractures numériques, que ce soit par l'accès aux infrastructures, mais aussi par le développement des connaissances des populations pour un usage aisé de ces outils. On aura la science, comme je l'ai toujours souligné, depuis le déclenchement de cette pandémie. Les régions et gouvernements infranationaux sont en première ligne de la gestion de la crise et de la relance, d'autant plus qu'ils sont confrontés aux effets asymétriques de l'épidémie sur le plan sanitaire, économique, social et judiciaire entre les composantes du territoire. En effet, nous avons constaté les grandes zones urbaines, euh, nous avons tous constaté que les grandes zones urbaines ont tellement touché, mais parce que certains d'une même des quartiers, notamment les plus favorisés, ont été plus frappés que d'autres. Alors que beaucoup de cas ont été Cette répartition est ou toute autre crise ainsi que l'atteinte des objectifs des agents d'amont dépend largement de la protection de complémentarité entre gouvernance qui serait à l'imitant de le renforcement des ressources budgétaires et humaines mises à la disposition des régions et des autres collectivités en première ligne pour et ses impacts et pour répondre aux besoins aux, euh, aux, Allemands, aux régions et aux euh, oui. plutôt aux régions et aux Mais ce primordial en plus des différences que j'ai cité précédemment est de passer l'humain au cœur de toutes les politiques de développement, un programme de développement durable 
intégrer et territorialisé qui permettent la participation citoyenne avec le secteur privé pour la mobilisation. Apologies, uh, the sound is really, really poor. Merci, monsieur, pour vos remarques. Uh, la traduction a été difficile uh, en raison de la connexion. Désolé. Merci beaucoup. Really sorry for that, uh, colleagues. Uh, thank you very much again for your patience. We can't control connectivity issues in all corners of the planet, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, but uh, let me wrap this session up now. I know we're running a little bit behind time, just with two or three key points again. Um, one, the idea that the SDGs will be will not be achieved without a strong multi-level cooperation and multi-level governance. We have only nine years, only nine years to achieve the global goals that we have set for ourselves. And without a very strong action at all levels from international to local and down to the communities, we're not going to be able to achieve those goals. Um, Second, we're seeing more and more communities, local governments, regional governments, um, national governments embracing the SDGs as their development frameworks. This is fundamental. Uh, national development frameworks or local development frameworks, post-COVID recovery plans, climate action plans cannot be divorced from the Agenda 2030 and the global goals. They have to be integrated and there has to be that one global framework, the Agenda 2030, which remains the most robust framework for uh, an inclusive, resilient uh, and sustainable recovery, a just and fair and green recovery uh, from the pandemic. And the third, the absolute importance of taking communities along, of taking local communities, organized communities, whether it is communities of the poor or it is the middle class, of taking them along in this process, a, a point that that Edgar made uh, in, in, the, in this quest for solidarity is absolutely fundamental. So we have to, while we look above to the multilateral system and to building an inclusive multilateralism, we should not forget to look to the grassroots to take them absolutely along in this entire uh, process. So with those words, Emilia, thank you very much for the opportunity. You and Habitat is absolutely privileged to have this special relationship and this special partnership with local and regional governments, the constituency, UCLG, the Global Task Force. And uh, thank you again for maintaining and, and driving this thriving space for our engagement together. Over to you, back to you. Thank you, thank you uh, very much, uh, Shipra, and, and, and thank you also for your patience uh, with these connectivity issues that are beyond uh, our uh, control. Um, I think we have had a very interesting uh, panel that has covered uh, many issues that will be tackled also as we continue the program uh, of the constituency in the high level political forum. There are many sessions uh, coming up. I will mention some of them right after our next uh, speaker we are very privileged to have um with us uh, today for uh, some closing remarks of, of this event. Maria Francesca Espatolizano, Assistant Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs of the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, uh, DESA, as you know, uh, one of the uh, co-organizers of this uh, institutionalized local and regional government forum. We take great pride to uh, see this uh, forum uh, coming up every year. So, um, Excellency uh, Maria Francesca, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And let me start, uh, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, mayors, governors, ladies and gentlemen, by saying how pleased I am to deliver a few closing remarks at this fourth high-level local and regional government forum, a special event 
the three in the UN uh, Department of Economic and Social Affairs are pleased to support in connection with the UN High-Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development. And first of all, I will express our gratitude to, to all the distinguished mayors, governors, national government representatives, and high-level experts from all around the world who joined us during the past two days. Our experience, or rather your experience, and especially in this year of the pandemic, your commitment, insights, and inspiration will reverberate and support our common goal of achieving the SDGs for all at all levels. I also want to sincerely thank and acknowledge our partners from the Global Task Force of Local and Regional Governments, UN Habitat, UNDP, and the Local 2030 Coalition. Every year, we continue to further consolidate our partnership and collaboration, and this is reflected on the excellent outcomes of this event. To all participants connecting from around the world, we hope you were inspired and further motivated to continue your action towards the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. Ladies and gentlemen, throughout this special event, we have heard from all speakers how the SDGs are now more relevant than ever. The COVID-19 pandemic has challenged years of progress and advancement on sustainable development. At the same time, it has further demonstrated how we need the strong collaboration between national governments and stakeholders, including local and regional governments as we address the crisis and design recovery strategies that make our societies and communities stronger, more resilient and more sustainable. Ladies and gentlemen, this year's event has touched upon very critical issues, including the unique role of local and regional governments in ensuring the provision of basic public services, as you have said, the importance of guaranteeing a social inclusion and prosperity for all, as well as the transformation of work and evolving, uh, sorry, evolving production and consumption models. You also discussed the importance of multi-level governance and the need for strong, inclusive institutions at sub-national level as key elements for achieving the 2030 Agenda. You discussed the complex challenges and specific needs of local and regional governments, including those related to financing, access to local data, and capacity building. You also shared with concrete examples, policies, programs, and initiatives that demonstrate how partnerships and inclusive environments can be the strategic way to address gaps, maximize resources, and achieve common goals. I would like to invite you all to visit the UN DESA SDG Acceleration Action Database and register and share information about your own ambitious commitments in support of the 2030 Agenda. This is a unique platform that shines a spotlight on efforts by all stakeholders at all levels that can bring about change and inspire others. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in an extraordinary challenging time. In this State of the Planet Address, the UN Secretary General reminded us that the global commons and global well-being are interlinked. This means we must act more broadly, more holistically, across many fronts to secure the health of our planet on which all life, I repeat, all life depends. In concluding, we are now in the decade of action for delivery of the SDGs. To be successful, we need the driving force and creative energy of local and regional governments, working in close partnership with national governments and of all stakeholders. Please do count on UN DESA and our continued support to your endeavors. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, Assistant Secretary General for Economic Affairs. Um, a few years back, very, very few years back, maybe only a couple of years back, uh, we would have not believed our ears when listening to these uh, closing remarks. Thank you so much for these very inspiring and encouraging words, I would say, for our constituency. It is important to acknowledge change when you are, uh, when you are seeing it, because otherwise you will not be able to trigger the transformation that comes comes from that change. And I think it, it will be very, very important for our constituency to acknowledge the uh, sophisticated, more mature type of partnership that we are able uh, to develop with many, many different parts of the United Nations uh, system. So thank you indeed for those remarks. And we will make sure that um, we make them known to uh, the constituency that is not uh, with us uh, today. Um, I would only uh, like to uh, give the floor to my colleague, uh, Lucius Lax, the Secretary General of the Commonwealth Local and Regional Governments Forum to close uh, for the final, final closing uh, on behalf of the constituency. And just allow me to remind you we are launching the guidelines for the voluntary local reviews tomorrow with you and Habitat. And we have also on the 15th, a session on voluntary subnational reviews and also sessions on voluntary local reviews on the 16th. So the high level political forum is certainly not over for our constituency. There are also ECLE uh, side events coming up and, and, and from many other partners. Thank you very much uh, for, uh, for these inputs, Lucy. Last word to you on behalf of the constituency. Thank you very much, Amelia, and thank you, colleagues. It's, it's, a, it's a great honor just to be able to kind of sum up and, and respond to your final comments, um, uh, Assistant Secretary General, but also to the comments for, from colleagues throughout the session today. And I think if we take away two lessons that are really critical and have really been emphasized throughout, I think the first is absolutely that we're all talking about people. We all want to keep communities and people right at the heart of the kind of development that we're looking to promote. And I think the second thing is that we now are really starting to acknowledge that we can't do this alone as different sectors. It's absolutely critical that we reach across, that we look at practical ways of working together. And I think, you know, we have the template in the Agenda 2030 in the SDGs. They speak really clearly to the commitment to multi-level governance. And that goes right from central government, some global development discussions, right to the community. And local government should be and must be absolutely a part of that. So I think I would really um, thank everybody who's made some amazing presentations over the course of the last two days to show practically how local government is already rising to the challenge, is already looking at practical ways of doing this. I'd urge everybody to attend the sessions tomorrow on the VLR process and, and learn further how we can actually align better what's happening nationally and internationally with what we're doing locally. Um, and, and I would really just like to close by um, saying how much we really appreciate the opening up of the discussion between the international agencies and local government. And the fact that we're having this discussion today, the fact that you're all around the table discussing with us is an incredible step forward for our movement. And we absolutely want to deliver on that commitment that we're making to you. And we look forward to, to continuing that discussion and taking our partnership further in a meaningful way. Thank you to everyone for a wonderful two days. Thank you, colleagues. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.